Hi everybody, it's me, Tim Dodd, the Everyday Astronaut, coming to you late tonight for me. It's just after midnight here, Central Standard Time in Iowa, and I'm going to be covering SpaceX's Telstar 19V launch. This is this is an exciting one for me because this is the second time they're launching their fully upgraded, the ultimate Falcon 9, the Block 5 version. That's so notice in my case here we have the 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 Falcon that has kind of that black inner stage here. Um, it has a, a lot of upgrades to make it fully reusable and hopefully um, virtually not even needing to do refurbishment on this as well, which is really exciting. I did a video on that recently explaining why um, why this is different than you know the space shuttle, how the space shuttle had to be massively refurbished between every flight. Um, a lot of people have pointed to the space shuttles being a criticism of why you know we've already tried reusability. Reusability doesn't work for rockets. Uh, I, I I think uh, SpaceX begs to differ. They're they're getting very very close here with with and hopefully they actually have it pretty much nailed down here with their their block five. Uh, that they, they took basically fifty some launches of data to come up with this ultimate version of the Falcon Nine that will be um, eventually launching humans, which is extremely exciting. As a matter of fact, launching humans sometime this year, uh, or I mean probably not this year, but really soon. Uh, we're just getting closer and closer that that window. Uh, is, it, that's going to be exciting when we finally start sending um, astronauts back up to the International Space Station instead of relying on the Russian Soyuz craft. So that's going to be awesome. Today's launch, though, is also pretty exciting. This is the heaviest satellite SpaceX has ever launched at just over 7,000 kilograms um, or 7 metric tons. It's like 15,000-ish pounds or so. Um, they're taking it out to geostationary transfer orbit. Um, this is the largest and or heaviest commercial satellite ever made. Which, in my opinion, is a little weird. A lot of things in space are starting to shrink. We're seeing CubeSats and SmallSats and all these small satellites, yet here we are with now the biggest commercial satellite ever. This is a KAKU band, uh, broad, broadband connection satellite. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, uh, it, it's heading out to geostationary transfer orbit. Not only is it the heaviest one SpaceX has ever launched, thanks to Block 5, they're able to attempt to land this. And I say attempt... Pretty loosely these days, uh, they have it pretty well nailed down. So uh, we hope to see a successful landing today on the on the drone ship. Of course, I still love you. This is taking off today um, from Slick Forty, SpaceX's kind of older launch pad out there uh, in Florida. So this is an East Coast launch. It's it's dark. It's it's midnight. Uh, it's it's one twenty there now actually. And uh, yeah, it's 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 really exciting because hopefully we get to see it land again. We're back to all these Block Five. Hopefully we aren't going to be seeing really almost any expended launches anymore. The theory with Block 5 is uh, if it can't be flown on Block 5, throw that thing up on a Falcon Heavy and then reuse the whole thing. So hopefully we're the days of seeing spent boosters is darn near close to being over. So if you don't know why that's important, click around on my channel a whole bunch. We talk a lot about you know why that's important. Uh, Falcon Heavy, I have a video called Why Falcon Heavy. That really goes into that quite a bit. Um, first off, thanks Chris Harris for the tip. Good evening. I hope you're doing well and thank you. Um, so I want to bring up a few fun things here before the, the webcast gets started. And you guys might have to remind me too, especially in the Discord. Um, let me know if the link goes up. I'm not seeing it on YouTube yet at all, the, the live stream. So um, let me let me know. Um, also, thanks Riley. Hi, how you doing? Re, 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 e, me, daddy. All right, so we have a few exciting things to, to bring up real quick before the live stream starts, um, or SpaceX's live stream, because it's going to be any minute. First off, I want to thank my Patreon supporters and the people in my Discord channel. Um, I wanted to mention that I'm doing some giveaways again. Uh, so if you want a chance to win flown pieces of space shuttles, these are both flown on, these are remnants from um, space shuttles. Uh, these will be framed. I will be doing two giveaways at 800, or a giveaway at 800 and a giveaway at 900. They'll be all framed up. I'll do a little like thing and like sign the back of the thing. I'm not going to sign any of this stuff because this is all like official documents and things. Um, so yeah, so this one comes off Columbia. I don't remember where this one comes off of. Um, but yeah, flown in space, um, actual space hardware, um, which is awesome. I, lo I love flown material. So if you want a chance to win... Uh, flown pieces of space shuttle will be all framed and pretty signed from me. Uh, head on over to patreon.com slash everyday astronaut. Um, I'm able to do all of what I do working 60, 70, 80 hours a week to help produce as much content as I can. Thanks to you, Patreon supporters. So if you want to help financially support patreon.com slash everyday astronaut. And the way that works is the more, like if you donate uh, or contribute like a dollar a month, 
uh, you get your name kind of put into like a, a dollar hat basically and then we aggregate all the numbers and then draw from there just a randomizer Boop, and I'll ship it anywhere around the world so we have a lot of people from everywhere so um, hi hi discord I love you guys um, the other thing I wanted to mention, this is an uh, even more exciting giveaway in my opinion, because yeah, flown space stuff is cool, but how does $10,000 sound? This, now this might seem like some kind of thing. This is actually for NASA. Um, I forgot about this to be honest, guys, because I, this was almost two years ago. They asked me to be a judge. Look at who's this weird looking guy. I'm a photographer and space evangelist. Uh, yeah, I'm doing a, uh, I'm helping them judge, um, a, a, uh, a contest. So if you guys want a chance to win, let's see. Um, I'm just looking at this here. Yeah, look at this. Ten thousand dollars for the top price for film, and uh, fifteen hundred dollars for a poster. So if you do any, you know, digital, you know, des graphic design, or if you're if you make you know cool videos, check this out. This is at um, Project Mars. So ProjectMarsCompetition.com. Check it out. Uh, the entries are due already in like six weeks or something. So I'll be tweeting about that more. Make sure you follow me on Twitter. This is really exciting. I'm really excited to, to be up here with people like Bobic, like a legit, <laughs> actual, amazing NASA, and a real NASA astronaut, Nicole Stott. She's, uh, she's awesome because she does a lot of art. She's kind of known as the, art, um, the artistic astronaut. So um, yeah, she's amazing. And also some of these people are like actual crazy. Like this guy uh, directed a movie called Star Wars. Hmm. Anyway, uh, yeah, so if you guys want a chance to do that, please check that out. Uh, again, that is at uh, Project Mars. Just search projectmarscompetition.com or whatever. Don't search.com. That's my news for today. Um, yeah, so, oh my gosh, guys, thank you. Ryan, hi, Tim. I was, I was always really into space as a kid, but, like, but you, along with SpaceX and Scott Manley, got me excited about it again. Thank you for all you do. Well, thank you, Ryan. That honestly means a lot. Uh, all right, guys, I obsessively read like everything that's ever posted so i take feedback like this really seriously and it honestly means a ton i can't tell you uh how much work goes into making content um and now that i have a, a by the way guys I, I updated my website to be um actually like a proper uh let me show you this dun, 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 dun. if you want news your rocket news come start getting it from me i'll write it with my fingers <laughs> on a keyboard sometimes. Ta-da! I have now updated stuff like this, so come check it out, guys. Um, but yeah, I couldn't do it if it wasn't thanks to you guys. So again, yes, thank you, everydayastronaut.com. So many things. Okay, Joel, thanks, Tim. Keep it up, man. Thank you very much. And and Ryan, I appreciate what you do. You teach us, teach all us amateur space lovers about how everything works and what things we might expect. Please, please keep doing what you're doing. Well, thank you, Ryan, again. I can't, that feedback, I absolutely hear it and I, I really feel it. So thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, monitor SpaceX now, are they actually live? I still don't see them on YouTube. I don't have, anyone have a link for me? I don't actually have, hmm. I'm still not seeing anything on SpaceX's YouTube channel yet. I will keep refreshing. Um, hopefully I'm not missing something. Uh -huh. Let me just double check. Oh. Looks like the live stream has started. All right, so any questions before we get this thing going? Uh, oh, there we go. Thank you, Sloppy, you also in our Discord channel. Um, let's see, oh, Fur, Fur On in Discord says, uh, hey Tim, if I were to get into the rocket industry, what would be a good place to start? I'd say the best place to start is by being enthusiastic and know that that's what you want to do um, because it's a ton of work. I mean, the people that are actual engineers, you know, there's there's a crazy amount of STEM, you know, so science, technology, engineering, mathematics um, involved in, in actually being in the industry. But there's also room for art, um, communications, things like that. So just make sure that you're like obsessed with it and that it's what's really important to you. Start there as long as you start there. Um, I, I don't think you can go wrong. So, um, other than that, study hard, work hard. I don't know. I, I, I can't say because my path into this whole thing has been so different than traditional. You know, it's just been, um, I always say that my path went from, um, obsession or from a obsession to a profession. So hobby, obsession, profession. So, um, that's how photography was for me. Um, so yeah, 
All right. Uh, trying to keep up here with you guys. Um, it was torn down. Oh yeah. So we should mention too that, that on May 11th of this year is when SpaceX launched the first Block Five. Again, the ultimate version of the Falcon 9, which will be more and more reusable. Uh, and they actually you know, kind of like they did when they landed that Orbcom 2 booster, December 21st, 2015. Uh, they tore that thing down to make sure that, you know, their engineering and all their planned everything was right on par and it held up like they thought it would hold up. So they did that same thing here with the Banga Bandu set uh, 1, <laughs> which was launching in May 11th of this year. And uh, so there was a pretty big gap between these launches. I wonder how deep they got into it before they maybe checked some things that they were like, we need to make sure this is performing as needed. Um, so I'm curious if that's why there's a little bit of a break there in, in Block 5s and how much they would have been able to change. And again, remember, they, they're pretty much committed to this. They can't really change anything um, up to seven times, although... <laughs> so they need to fly um, a Block 5, not the same exact booster, but they need to fly Block 5 seven times before they can certify it for human flight. Um, that's something that NASA came up with um, in order to qualify it. But they also haven't yet flown the COP v 2.0 and that's copv is composite overwrapped pressure vessel so that's like the they're basically like a, an inconel or an aluminum tank wrapped really 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 tight with carbon fiber and they've experienced two different failures kind of around the copv structures um they're their only two failures have been with that so spacex has gone to the ends of the earth it sounds like to make these things virtually indestructible now um and they have not yet actually flown the first block five and it sounds like maybe even the next couple still will not have that copv 2.0 in it so they can't start this one of seven until they get that 2.0 um copv in there so hopefully um we hear about more on that like you know when that's going to happen because we want them to get those seven under their belt so they can actually totally be certified and ready to go um and of course it's it's going to be really exciting that in the very near, near, near future, uh, they're going to be doing DM-1. Their, their Dragon just an, uh, is an uncrewed, so there will not be anyone on board, uh, but it will be their Dragon 2. That's already out of the Cape. It's gone through testing at Plumbrook Station in Ohio, where I've, I love that place. That place is amazing. They have the world's largest thermal vacuum chamber. It's like, it's, I, I don't even remember offhand. It's, it's huge. It's like 160 feet tall or something. Sorry, 50 meters tall. And, um, and it also has this huge acoustic reverberant chamber that can use nitrogen horns to blast really, really, really loud um, sound pressure at spacecraft and everything and make sure everything survives, uh, will survive a launch. So it went through all that certification there. It's now at the Cape, which is a good sign. If it had gone back to, to, uh, to, to Hawthorne in California, that would have been a pretty bad sign. So it's at the Cape and further processing. Hopefully we see that thing, hopefully we see that thing fly here um, it's currently slated for no earlier than August 31st. Uh, that's what their license is for. So hopefully we see that happening right around, just soon thereafter. I, I never think, you know, this far out, I would never be like, yep, it's happening August 31st. I'd say there's almost no chance of it happening August 31st, but I would hope that it's soon thereafter. So also, Renow Gaming, uh, you're welcome for all the hard work. I only do it because I absolutely love it. I, I love this stuff. This is what I live, eat, breathe, sleep, dream. Um, this is it so um, yeah so thank you uh, and Muggsy your 12 year old daughter wants to be an aerospace engineer and she loves watching your streams thanks a ton that is amazing Muggsy and your daughter uh, work hard for us because we need you uh, humanity needs you to actually help build and and prepare the next generation of explorers uh, and spacecraft to get us there so please work hard for all of us work hard for humanity because uh, you're the ones that are going to be making this stuff happen in the future. So good luck and thank you for tuning in. Uh, Noah, thank you for everything you do. Keep making the kinds of content you love making. Well, thank you, Noah. I've had, that is something that I've been working on now lately is how to kind of shift uh, away from what I feel like is like going to be high traffic videos and just focus on the ones that I really like talking about. So I'm kind of trying to get more back to the grassroots of it. Um, I think I kind of got like chasing the tail of the... Uh, but this one will have a lot of views and stuff. And now I'm just like, I'm just going to do what I want to do. So hopefully you guys still uh, find that stuff interesting. So um, am I going to stream the, the Delta IV Heavy Launch? Yes, that is the Parker Solar Probe. Um, I, I'm actually going to be at the Cape literally two days before that launch. But I don't think I'm going to be able to stick around for the launch. So 
Um, and Chris, donate, so uh, he's inside the... Okay, <laughs> politics aside, I, I, I typically leave politics out of this, but thank you for the tip, and also Thomas, thank you. Um, yeah, let's, let's bring this baby full up. Let's listen into what they say. Remember, I don't talk over them, or I try not to, because I want to listen in and hear what we're saying too, but then I'll help digest, especially during coast phases, like there will be today, so... So let's tune in, listen here. It is July 21st, 2018, just after 10.30 p.m. Pacific Daylight Time, and you're looking at a live view of the Falcon 9 rocket with the Telstar 19 Vantage spacecraft on top. A wedding liftoff from Space Launch Complex 40 at Cape Canaveral Air Force Station in Florida. Good evening from SpaceX headquarters in Hawthorne, California. My name is Brian Malstead and I'm a software engineer in our flight software department here at the headquarters and I'll be your host for tonight's webcast. Now today we are launching the Telstar 19 Vantage spacecraft to a geostationary transfer orbit. Liftoff is currently targeted for 1.50 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time or 5.50 Coordinated Universal Time. This will be SpaceX's 13th launch so far this year, and today we will be flying a brand new Block 5 booster, which we will be attempting to land on our East Coast drone ship named, of course, I Still Love You. Yes. I'll get back to you, Gary. Good question. Look at how beautiful that Block 5 is. I love that black inner stage. A little contrast, you know. Not all just... Giant. Now, for tonight's mission, we're launching out of Space Launch Complex 40 at Cape Canaveral Air Force Station, which is one of SpaceX's two East Coast launch sites. On the pad, you can see the two-stage Falcon 9 vehicle. It stands 70 meters tall, which is greater than the wingspan of a 747 aircraft. The spacecraft itself is currently sitting inside of the 17-foot diameter payload fairing, which is that round upper portion at the top of Stage 2. Once we reach the vacuum of space, we will jettison the fairing halves as stage two continues on its journey to orbit. Now, tonight's mission is the second flight of our Block 5 vehicle design, and it is the first Block 5 launch from Space Launch Complex 40. Now, Block 5 represents a series of upgrades to Falcon 9, and these designed to allow us to reuse each F9 10 times or more, as well as reduce refurbishment between flights. You can see some of the primary visual differences in the Block 5 design, the most prominent of which is that black inner stage in the middle of your screen now. Remember. So the vehicle so undergoes the various operations to prepare for liftoff, and much of this timeline is centered around what we call loading the vehicle with the fluids that are necessary to fly. This is analogous to filling your car with fuel, but rocket engines need additional substances to work. Now, in order to combust out in space where there is no oxygen, we have to bring our own, and we do so with densified liquid oxygen, or LOX. The fuel for Falcon 9 is RP-1, which is basically rocket-grade kerosene. Now, those two substances together are the propellants, and they began loading about an hour ago. This loading process continues until the last few minutes of countdown as we top off. A third item that you actually need to start the combustion of a fuel in an oxidizer is the ignition source, which is just like the spark plugs in your car. Our ignition source is a chemical mixture called TTEP. The T part pertains to triethyl aluminum, and TEB is triethyl borane. Now, when those contact each other, they start burning, and they burn so green. You should be able to see a quick glimpse of this with a green flash just before liftoff. In addition to those propellants, the rocket has pressurants on board to help the propellants flow. Falcon 9 uses helium for its pressurant, and we began the loading of this helium about 15 minutes ago. Now, regarding weather out there at Cape Canaveral, we're currently 60% favorable in status for liftoff, with the primary watch items being cumulus and thick layer clouds. The maximum upper level winds that we're seeing right now are coming from the west, and they're coming in at about 30 miles per hour at 40,000 feet. Now, we generally want to keep all winds to be under about 30 miles per hour, and we also ensure that there isn't too much wind shear. 
Now wind shear is when winds at different altitudes are moving in different directions, so they create that shearing condition on the vehicle. The team will continue launching weather balloons to check the statuses of the, at those various altitudes, and they do so every 30 minutes. But overall, weather continues to be go from Space Launch Complex 40 at Cape Canaveral Air Force Station. I should mention real quick, the Falcon 9 in particular is uh, actually more The next pre-launch milestone that we have coming up is that. what we call engine chill. This is where we flow a very small amount of liquid oxygen through the engines to cool them down to their operating temperature. And this is so that when we start feeding them their full flow in flight, the lock stays nice and cold and it doesn't heat up to cause bubbles or other performance issues. The spacecraft, Telstar, is currently healthy as well. In these final moments before launch, just like Falcon 9, they are conducting checkouts to ensure that the spacecraft systems are functioning nominally before they are called to do so in flight. Another item we'd like to check is the range itself. Now, the range conducts many pre-launch tasks, including clearance of the pad and all the surrounding areas as well as the neighboring airspace and the coastal clearance. So the range is given us their green. If we do need it, a backup launch opportunity is available Monday morning, July 23rd, starting at about 1.50 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time, so about 24 hours from this moment. So tonight, SpaceX is launching Telstar 19 Vantage. It's one of a new generation of Telesat spacecraft designed to serve today's bandwidth intensive applications. For us down here on Earth, that simply translates to improved access for all things internet related. This pertains to everything from individual internet access to both business and government applications, all the way to direct to home satellite TV and much, much more. In addition to the improved broadband connectivity across the Americas and the Atlantic, Telstar 19 Advantage will also be able to provide internet connectivity to those in, in rural areas and in remote areas and even coverage over the North Atlantic Ocean, which is super important when it comes to providing internet access for commercial airlines and even cruise ships. So in addition to being able to kick back and enjoy an in-flight movie or check your email from 35,000 feet, the aircraft crews and the maintenance teams are also able to benefit from this in-flight connectivity. So here's a closer look at the Telstar 19 Vantage satellite we'll be launching tonight. Cool. I like learning about this stuff. Although, I'm going to get flagged for music right now. I almost guarantee it. So just in case, <laughs> lately, anytime there's like stuff like this, uh, I get flagged for music. So we can kind of read this. Um, luckily, there's no talking. I'm still listening to it myself. Um, but uh, I wanted a, a few things. Number one... Something interesting about the Falcon 9, because it's so skinny, it, it looks like it might be kind of a small rocket. It's it's huge. It's actually the same diameter as the Atlas V. It's actually the exact same diameter as the solid rocket boosters on um, the space shuttle. But the difference is it's extremely tall, really tall, uh, 70 meters, 220 feet tall, 230 feet tall. Um, and that actually makes it really susceptible to those upper level wind shears they were talking about. So it, it because it's the finest rocket, that, that's the definition of its width to length, it means it's it's extra susceptible to those upper level winds. So they SpaceX is one of the only companies I've ever heard having to talk about um, upper level wind shears um, because the rocket is uh, that like kind of tall <laughs> and, and fine. So um, the BFR, on the other hand, sounds like it's going to be... Um, very, very, very stable and be able to launch in almost all conditions uh, is what Elon recently tweeted about. So we have a ton of people to, to reply to. Um, I just want a real quick thanks to Gary. Um, I will talk more about Mars, BFR and Mars in 2020. Remind me later. Um, and thank you, Sean. Thank you, Corona. Um, oh, if, I, if I'm out there for that stuff, I, will, I would love to meet up. Um, King Nothing, I'll talk about that away from liftoff so let's check back in one more time with the status of the rocket fuel as i mentioned earlier was doing the loading process well it is now fully loaded on both stages first and second lox is currently being topped off as we speak now you can totally see the venting coming from the side of the vehicle right now and that's because of a very simple reason we cool the liquid oxygen down to very cold temperatures to phase change it into a liquid but when the outer layer of that liquid is exposed to the standard temperature and pressure of Florida's air, it evaporates back into a gas, and that's what you're seeing on your screen there. 
Uh, very soon, you'll see those cradle arms of the transporter erector holding the vehicle. They'll release, and then the strong back will slightly retract in preparation for liftoff. And then, at T minus one minute, the rocket's internal flight computers will take full control, which you'll hear on the countdown net as Falcon 9 is in startup. So, with all systems go, let's listen into the final five minutes of countdown now. They're gonna stop talking for five minutes. That's that's uh, that's pretty long for them. Okay, so. Um, let me let me uh, talk about a few things. King Nothing asked actually um, if I would join Trump's space force if I could. Well, first off, I don't really have any aspirations to work in space. Someday I would love to be just a full blown tourist with like a slushy and like pizza going somewhere cool like the moon. Uh, I have no personal aspirations to ever become any kind of working astronaut at all. Uh, I'm definitely not qualified. Um, but that being said, I have no idea. No one really still knows what Space Force really is. We have no idea if that will include human presence in space as well, or if it's all just going to be, you know, unhuman, you know, robots and things. Um, and all net, Tony, uh, you wanted to know my opinion on the double shuttle concept NASA had for the STS, the Space Transportation System. So there's basically a concept of having well, almost a similar orbiter like we see right on top of a giant rocket plane, basically. Uh, the first stage would be a giant rocket plane turn around and land. I am still to this day sad that that was not the present concept. Um, yes, it would have been more expensive to initially develop, but dang it, I really think that would have been a cool concept and potentially would have been the difference between making it cheaper versus making it better than the uh, which is one of the most expensive rides in space. Um, yeah, I love that thing. Um, Arvid, 750 at Norway, haven't slept. <laughs> You're welcome. Thanks for tuning in. I hope you can stay awake just a little bit longer. And uh, POS Ninja One, you hope you're old enough to go to Mars when SpaceX goes. I hope so too. And Schizo, here's five dollars because Block Five. Well, thank you. Uh, I can't wait to see this baby launch again. We have T minus three minutes and, and twenty seconds. Uh, yes, it is great. So I did want to mention real quick um, the BFR and Mars. So Gary Lane had asked, "Hey Tim, so I uh, wanted to know if there's any shot of BFR going to Mars in 2020." That's stage one locks is closed off for flight. Okay, good. Locks closed out. That means they closed off the loading of the oxygen tank, so it's now in flight pressures. Um, and you'll see it continuing to vent. By by the way, guys, all this condensation coming off that's just liquid oxygen turning into gaseous oxygen, which does like minus two hundred and seventy three degrees Celsius or something. And as it expands, it expands a thousand times. It's still really cold, so they vent it so it doesn't rub through the tanks. And that's you see it. Con condensing the water molecules in the air, forming these clouds around the rocket. Totally normal stuff. This stuff's just crazy cold. If you went up and touched it right now, you wouldn't want to do that. So, okay, back to that question. Sorry. Um, I just don't think 2020 for the BFR is going to happen. Uh, man, that'd be aggressive. And man, that'd be... It'd be amazing. Don't get me wrong. I mean, that's literally... I would love nothing more than that. And there's still rumors that we might be seeing some kind of hop... Some kind of flights with the Raptor engine for some subscale testing of the BFS or the Big Falcon ship, the upper stage portion of the BFR. I. 2020 just sounds unbelievably insanely fast. Um, I would love that, but I, I'd say 2022 would still be pretty aggressive. Bradley, where are the Today Asian Space Flight history streams with Jacob EQ? That's a great question, Bradley. Jacob is actually working with my brother in law on. They're opening up a ninja gym here in Cedar Falls, Iowa, uh, called Ninja U. It's actually going to be... I've seen some ninja gyms that look like they're made out of, like, plywood. This thing is unbelievable. We're, I think it's going to be, like, the best ninja gym in the whole Midwest. Guess and guess. it's in Cedar Falls, Iowa. It's going to be unbelievable. He's been working, like, 80 hours a week on that thing lately. So he just has not had time. I want to get back into that, but I'm also working on some other things that hopefully might help make up for that so stay tuned and thank you for your tip um did 39a have bunkers yes they did they had the the rubber room it's called afts is on for flight uh lisa stojanovsky in our discord asks if i'm going to any space conferences He's i'm planning to, to go to I aic in bremen germany in october hopefully if i can um that's the international aeronautical congress uh spacex previously has talked about their mars ambitions at the last two um, at Adelaide in Australia last year and the prior lunch. year in Guadalajara, Mexico. This year it's in Germany. Uh, we still don't have any confirmation if SpaceX is indeed doing a talk there, but we'd assume they are. I think Blue Origin is. Hopefully, hopefully. All net Tony, thoughts on Saturn shuttle? And $5. Well, thank you. 
um, on Saturn shuttle. I'm not familiar with a Saturn shuttle. I'll have to look into that and get back to you. Devil. Oh, I think I know what you're talking about. We'll talk about that in a second. I think I know what you're talking about. But yes, here we go, guys. We're at T minus five. One, zero, ignition. Go block. Yes! Go block five, number two! Yes. Do it, baby. Heaviest satellite they've ever launched. And they're going to recover it. It's amazing. Sound coming off this time. Power to one and we've had successful liftoff of the Falcon 9 rocket as we see all nine of those first stage Merlin engines glowing beautifully, carrying Telstar 19 Vantage to geostationary transfer orbit. Now, upon ascent, we go through max Q as our first milestone, and again, that's the maximum aerodynamic pressure. It's an important milestone because it means that from that moment on, we're going through thinner and thinner atmosphere and less and less stress. Oh, you can see the shock wave, the, the pressure wave. That was cool. The vehicle has reached maximum aerodynamic pressure. And we've got that confirmation on the nets that we have gone through max Q. So again, less and less stress in the vehicle as we go up and up from here on out. Now, we're going to come through three events in pretty quick succession, and those are Miko, then stage separation, and then second engine start, or SES number one. Now, those represent the cutoff of those nine first stage engines that you see burning right now. Those will stop burning. Then the stages will separate once neither stage is burning. And then the second stage, once separated, will start its burn. And that's called SES, or second engine start number one. Those three events will happen pretty quickly in a 10 second span, starting about 30 seconds from now. Again, Miko, separation, SES. And notice, guys, you can see the exhaust of the nine Merlin engines getting wider and wider and wider. That's because the, at the ambient atmosphere outside, they're now at 42 kilometers in altitude. So it's really high up. It's already above most of the atmosphere. So you can just see that there's no air pressure to, to push in that plume like we see it on the ground where it comes out in a column. Now it's getting wider and wider and wider because the air gets thinner and thinner. So that's kind of one of those cool things. And that's why the, the engine on the second stage has such a big, wide, and huge chamber to direct that exhaust. Here we go, stage separation. Be Hopefully. Good. Oh, thank God. Stage separation confirmed. <laughs> All right. Oh, yeah. Wow, look at the inner stage on the left getting pummeled by the exhaust of, this, of the second stage. And you heard the callouts and saw the visual confirmation of main engine cutoff, oh, stage separation from those onboard cameras, and then second engine start. And as a treat, we were able to see that green flash from the T-tab that I mentioned earlier as second stage ignited. The next milestone is fairing deploy. I mentioned these earlier, but we're going to jettison those fairing halves because once we're out in space, we no longer need that aerodynamic shield. So in order to become more fuel efficient, we get rid of this unnecessary mass. Did you guys see the, you could see the first stage was getting pummeled by the exhaust even uh, across the kind of the, the fuselage. And it was like creating this really pretty like plasma plume. It was gorgeous. That was awesome. Okay, so this is from inside the fairing, so now this has to deploy. There we go. Fairing separation confirmed. And we've successfully had fairing separation. As those halves gently float away, we now have Telstar attached to second stage, exposed to the vacuum of space, continuing on through its first burn. Now we had successful liftoff. First stage is heading back. The sequence that we're going to perform regarding the burns for the first stage is a two burn sequence. It's going to be re-entry and landing. There's no boost back burn this time because we're simply going to follow a ballistic trajectory out into the Atlantic Ocean. That will occur about two minutes from now. Sweet. It's looking good, guys. This is so far an awesome launch. I love that you can see Florida outlined with all the lights. That was so beautiful. Um, oh, I should mention no fairing recovery. This is East Coast. They do not have 
um, a Mr. Stevens big giant net to catch fairings on the East Coast yet. And if you're just joining us, we're looking at the the burning Merlin vacuum engine on second stage. The vehicles have lifted off. We have separated first and second stage. Second stage is continuing on, doing its first of two bland burns, carrying Telstar to GTO while first stage goes back and is about a minute and a half away from conducting its first of two burns upon re-entry through the atmosphere. So yeah, so the the West Coast um, has Mr. Stevens, the giant net. For now, they're just practicing basically on like iridium launches or launches that are polar orbit launches on the West Coast. I think once they have it kind of figured out, we'll start seeing uh, a boat on the East Coast. And at this point, I think that's just kind of as quickly as they can iterate changes um, both in the fairings and the recovery system in the fairings, but also to the to the boat. They just now extended the net four times. Now we're about 40 seconds times. away from that first re-entry burn, as I mentioned. And the purpose of this burn is to slow the vehicle down. Out in space, there aren't many particles. It's much sparser out there. But once we re-enter the Earth's atmosphere, the air actually creates quite a bit of drag on the vehicle. So we want to burn to slow ourselves down so that we don't experience a bunch of heat and stress accumulation on first stage. Um, yeah, and uh, Ariel in our Discord mentions that... So again, on your right, second stage in Merlin Vacuum is burning. On the left, we have first stage onboard cameras who are about to start their re-entry burn. All right, get ready for ignition. You can see it heating up as it's starting to hit some, some super compressed air and plasma. Stage one entry burn has started. And there you have it. This burn will last for about 20 seconds. And again, a quick eye would notice the continuity of that T-TEB green flash again as the engine's ignited. Second stage following nominal trajectory. All right, so this is to prevent it from blowing up, basically. So it slows stage it down. Stage one entry burn is shut down. And creates and a literal the force. the burn field. has concluded. To, to give some scope for what that burn did, we're currently traveling about a looks like uh, 17,000 kilometers per hour. That is multiple times the speed of a commercial airliner. And in about a minute and a half, we're going to be touching down on that drone ship. So in the course of about 90 seconds, we're going to be going from many times the speed of a jet to zero. So it really shows the efficacy of those burns as they decelerate the vehicle. Now, as we continue this launch sequence, or I'm sorry, this landing sequence of first stage, second stage is going to continue its action as well. Second stage, second engine cutoff, so SECO number one, that will conclude right in the middle of the landing sequence. So the landing burn will begin about 10 seconds later up in space. Second stage will stop firing its engine. And then about five seconds after that, back on Earth, the first stage will finish its landing burn and hopefully touch stage down on the surface of, of course, I still love you. So we currently don't have a good video downlink right now. Um, as it's going through that, that really as crazy As we go supersonic here, we're about 20 theory. seconds away from the landing burn. And then again, seconds, 10 seconds to Seco, and then five seconds after that to landing. So hopefully we do get a video stage feed coming one, back. Stage landing burn is starting. Landing burn started on stage one. So hopefully we'll see a, a stage video two, feed has from the drone ship AOS. too. Drone ship has acquisition of single a- signal AOS. Here we go. So this is looking on the deck of, of course, I still love you, the autonomous spaceport. Landing lights have deployed. And then this is the part we have to wait for. The plasma shakes the satellite. And of course, as a rocket descends upon a drone ship out in the middle of the ocean, it is of course difficult to sustain connection with it. So we'll get an update on that in a second. But we return back now to the primary mission, which is second stage with Telstar. It landed. Now Seco should have occurred as well. I believe we did hear that over the nets. So SECO did occur. So in the middle of that sequence of landing, as I said, second engine cutoff number one did happen. So the first of the two plan burns of second stage has concluded. We'll give you an update on the first stage landing as soon as we can. But for now, second stage is in good orbit. At this moment, we're going to enter about an 18-minute coast phase. Again, second stage has two planned burns, as I said, and the second one will start about 18 minutes from now. So see you at about T plus 26 minutes. Goodness, you got video feed. There we go. 
And before there we step is. into that coast period, there the vehicle is. Again, as a rocket fires upon a ship with a camera, it's hard to keep connectivity. But there it is, standing proud on Of Course I Still Love lighter. You. So with the landing behind us, again, primary mission, we're going to go into about a 17-minute coast phase now. We'll see you at T plus 26 minutes for an update on Telstar 19 Vantage. Yes. Awesome. Uh, this is why we come here together, everybody, so that we can uh, have something to do during this coast phase and answer some more questions. First things first, I'm going to turn on my air conditioning. It is crazy hot all of a sudden. So sorry if you hear a little extra noise. I'd rather be comfortable than worrying about that. Um, so we have a bunch of things to talk about. Uh, before we do, one more quick shout out to my Patreon supporters. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Discord, I love you guys. And again, remember, I am doing a giveaway of two flown pieces of space shuttle. So oh, I'm going to just do this. I'm going to swip, swip swap. So yeah, uh, a piece of flown space shuttle here. This has been in space. And another piece of flown space shuttle here. This has been in space. I'll be framing them up and giving them away at, at 800 and 900 Patreon supporters. So if you want to help uh, support what I do, Sign up at patreon.com slash everydayastronaut for a chance to win a flown piece of space shuttle. And I will also sign it and frame it and make it all pretty, ship anywhere around the world. Stop on down. You know what to do. Thank you, guys. So that was great. That was amazing. Uh, let's, let's do a real quick, before we even go on to answering direct questions, I'm just going to do a really quick summary of what they're currently doing, why it's happening, blah, blah, blah. So SpaceX uh, got paid by a company called... Um, I believe it's SSL, um, I forget, uh, but to launch their Telstar 19 Vantage or 19V satellite. This is the biggest commercial satellite ever built. They paid SpaceX to get it up to where it needs to go, and it needs to get up to a geostationary orbit, and those are the orbits that match the same orbit as the Earth, so they're a 24-hour period, so it circles the Earth at the exact same point as the Earth circles, so it looks like a fixed point in the sky, so they're always, boop, just little dots, and that's how you can do um, uplinks and stuff. It's just that's why you can literally point a satellite at one, and it stays there no matter what. Um, so they they had to get it there. So SpaceX is sending it there, but first, in order to do that, they have to kind of park it in. Right now, it's in this uh, just this low Earth orbit parking, and then you'll see uh, if you can see on the screen there a little bit um, down here uh, that tiny little thing that is my mouse. That's when they're going to reignite the second stage and raise the orbit up and line it on its correct inclination to match it up to exactly the point in sky in the sky that that satellite needs to be and then they turn off the engine and then they let they push and let go of that satellite so then the satellite actually has some built-in hydra uh, hydrazine thrusters so some little uh, kind of low powered thrusters to get it and eventually once it gets to that high point it will start slowly raising its orbit until it is in that perfect 24-hour period and then for station keeping it has four ion thrusters to really keep it perfectly and you know if it needs to do any on on station keeping it can use those ion thrusters which are extremely efficient but also very very low power um so that's what the whole mission is period and then the beautiful thing about what spacex does is they reuse that first stage they just landed the biggest part of the ship so basically from this black thing here all the way down they re they landed that two-thirds of the rocket uh is landed and able and able to be reused therefore saving in theory you know two-thirds the amount of money too um which is kind of the secondary mission because that's obviously say it wouldn't land it doesn't affect the mission the, the mission is to get the the payload up into space where it needs to be for their customer sometimes that customer is nasa sometimes it's ssl sometimes it's 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 anybody so um by uh yep ssl laurel yeah so space systems laurel so um really as long as that happens mission success and but for spacex's own interest they obviously want to reuse these boosters so they can sell you know make the most profit they can that's why they land them and reuse them and that's how they're going to be able to continue to bring the price of sending stuff to space down so yes it's it's awesome um, all right, so we have a few people to thank here real quick. Wow, geez. Um, uh, Kelby Reed asks, what do you think of the prospects for Virgin Galactic's orbital launch system? That's going to happen soon. Uh, so that's actually not Virgin Galactic. That's Virgin Orbital. So it's actually technically kind of a different company operating under the same umbrella. And they're going to be using a 747. Uh, people ask all the, you know, all the time, why don't they launch something you know, from a plane or a balloon or whatever? Well, Virgin's doing that. So Virgin Orbital will be launching a, a pretty good-sized rocket that they're building in-house. 
um, up to uh, you know a pretty high altitude, like forty thousand feet or twelve kilometers or so ish. I don't know. Yeah, I don't remember. Uh, and letting it drop off the plane, and then it takes off and goes into space, which is really cool. And that's going to start happening, I think, in August is what I'm hearing, maybe September. So really soon, uh, I'll definitely be covering that one. I think it's great. Uh, I think it's really cool. Uh, Paul, and thank you for your tip, by the way, Kelby. Um, Paul wants to know, will I make a patch of my logo? I actually do have some that I give out in person when I do meetups and stuff. Um, I have, yes, I actually, like I said, I actually have these. Uh, someday I'll have a way, so my web store... If you ever want to buy anything like hats and stuff, it's all uh, automatically fulfilled. But I am working on getting a new web store up so I can actually have patches and stuff like this um, in the store. So if you want one of those patches until then, you'll have to come to a meetup. Yeah. Uh, oh, by the way, people were asking about these models. Of course, these are buzzspacemodels.com, and that's the wonderful Ollie Braun. He's a wizard, and that's where I get these models from. So, yeah. All right, King Nothing. What is that ring? Oh, wait. Uh, one more. Sean. Uh, thank you, Joshua. Uh, and then Sean. Keep spreading the good word about spaceflight. Well, thank you, Sean. I can't help it. <laughs> uh, King Nothing. Uh, what is that ring that comes off the very end of the nozzle during stage separation? I've been noticing for the longest time, but you don't know what it is. It's a cork liner. So there's actually a piece of cork that they put around, like a, an insulator that they put around the nozzle. The nozzle bell is actually pretty fragile to the point where if you touch it, you're, the oils on your skin can cause the metal to crack. So they put this cork insulator on the outside so that it, when it's in the inner stage, uh, it kind of has, it's a stiffener, so it keeps it in place. And then as soon as the engine lights up, it just, poof, and it kind of disintegrates, and you see it peel away there. Uh, and then it just falls off and falls into the ocean. So yeah, that's what that is, and it's pretty awesome. Ryan, uh, that might be Mars visible above the second stage. Oh, that would be really cool. I missed that shot, but that would be awesome. It, yeah, right now, Mars, Jupiter, and Venus in the Northern Hemisphere are extremely bright. Venus is like, I swear I've never seen it that bright. Uh, it would be really cool if you could see one of those in, in the upper stage. Um, so that'd be amazing. Mario, you really love this channel? Well, thank you, Mario. That really genuinely means a ton. Thank you. Uh, and Michael. I do get that metric is common measurement system, but why do some companies, Blue Origin, get so much flack for using standard units for display purposes? Well, let's put it this way, Michael. Um, I First off, it, we should not be using the Imperial system. Period. That's We're wrong. In the United States, we're flat out wrong. The system makes no sense, first and foremost. So by conforming to our standards, I, I think it's it's, it's silly and, and the other caveat for that I might get people might get mad at me for saying that but the other caveat is what 365 million people out of 7 billion oh sorry besides Myanmar and like a kind of half England sometimes when they want uh, but they are way more metrically not impaired than we are um, but yeah metric is, is so much easier we need to use it we need to adopt it and why can't aerospace be the the vessel that gets us all kind of getting our heads wrapped around the metric system, which makes a ton of sense. Um, but the big reason is that it, globally, you know, uh, internationally, we're such a small percentage, like what? One or two or 5% of the population? I don't know, I'm really bad at trying to do that kind of math. Uh, so it's, we're such a small percentage, it's, it really seems um, isolating to the rest of the world when they're looking at something that means almost nothing to them, you know? 44,000 feet! You know, so that's... I'm a pretty big I, I'm a pretty big stickler. I realize that more than half of my audience is international, so that's why I've decided to always go metric first. Um, and I'm I'm now I'm no longer in my videos even going to be talking audibly saying the the imperial conversion. I'm just going to do on screen conversions because that last video I did had way too many numbers and it's and it doubled the amount of things I had to say every time. So just I think it weakened the point I was trying to make when you have to do the conversion. So they they will be on screen from now on in my videos. And metric spoken only because metric makes sense um that's my rant about metric sorry <laughs> and we're now any word on the next attempt for electron that's a great question um for those of you that don't know the electron rocket let me see if my thing works here electron oh maybe uh, mm, um maybe it didn't work so basically uh the electron rocket uh is rocket lab's awesome little uh, tiny baby almost Falcon 9 type looking vehicle because it has nine engines on the first stage one vacuum optimized upper stage It was supposed to launch there is two launch attempts about three weeks ago 
and we haven't heard anything yet. So I hope everything's okay. Uh, a, a delay or a slip like this is cheaper than an explosion. Someone recently said that they'll take a hold over an ex the a hold is cheaper than an explosion, and I love that. That's so true. So hopefully they're just really you know being cautious at this point, and I applaud them for that. I would much rather them make sure everything's perfectly fine. And so we haven't really heard any updates, um, but I can't wait for them to because I'm a big fan. Um, James, what do I think about Australia's new space agency? Congrats. I mean, that's amazing. I, I hope that more com uh, more countries start to really get on board and, and you know work on their presence in space. Um, I don't have much outlined on what that means. Maybe Lisa Stojanovsky from the show Tomorrow on, on YouTube. Uh, I, I need to say this every time I, I remember. If you don't watch Tomorrow on YouTube, what are you doing? What what are you doing? I had one guy, a guy comments every time I talk about tomorrow and goes, I hate that you talk about tomorrow. They don't like humans on Mars. What? A, don't ever hate a show because someone has a different opinion than you. That's very, again, like tribalistic. I, I like, you know, we need to encompass all views and, and help that broaden our own understanding. Uh, first off, I don't hate the human presence on Mars. I can, I can promise you that. <laughs> Two of them work for a company trying to get people to Mars very, very, very soon. Uh, yeah, so if you don't watch tomorrow on YouTube, they do a live broadcast every Saturday um, at like 18 UTC, I think. Uh, it's amazing. You can comment live. It shows up in the show. Really well produced. The best space news there is on the entire internet. So please, right now, sign up. Go subscribe to tomorrow and tune in every Saturday. Please. There's some of my, some really good friends. I love them. So please check them out. All right. Uh, and, oh, Ra Rajasikar. For all your cool videos and effort with lots of love and appreciation. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. That means a lot. Uh, Roman M says metric equals science. I have to agree. I absolutely have to do, have to agree. Um, so, um, am I going to do a Vandenberg in a couple of days? If so, will I do a meetup? Uh, unfortunately, no, I will not be doing... I will not be out in Vandenberg. I live in Iowa, so it's actually pretty rare for me to go to these launches. Um, so I still have not seen... I've seen one launch out of Vandenberg ever only, and it was um, uh, OCO2, or, uh, Orbiting Observatory, Carbon Observatory. It was on a Delta II, uh, and that was in 2014 or 15. So it's been a while since I've seen anything out of Vandenberg. I have not seen a SpaceX launch in Vandenberg. That's definitely on my to-do list. Maybe... Maybe I'll take a little road trip when I get a new car here this year and take it out there. That'll be... Yes, I, I need to see one at, at Vandenberg. So when I do, I'll do a meetup. Um, and also, uh, if when I'm down in Florida, since it's going to be near the Parker Solar Probe launch, the PSP launch, I might try to do a meetup then as well. So if you're going to be in Florida uh, at the early August, stay tuned. Make sure you're following me on Twitter. Uh, that's where I normally... Twitter and Instagram, I, I normally let people know about meetups and stuff. So... I'm orbiting carbon observatory. Thank you, Sloppy in Discord. Um, and Michael, vid about lesser known space startups soon. Yes, Michael, I I need to start doing just one off videos like that. Um, I have I can't even tell you the list I have right now to get video. It's like forty or fifty videos. I'm beyond overwhelmed. Uh, uh, yeah. Besides, yeah, I'll get to it. I I know. Hopefully I have a long life and a long career because I am having more video ideas written down than I have time to make them at this point. So wish me luck. I'm working on some shorter videos. Hopefully that'll help. The last couple of videos have been like almost 30 minutes long. I'm making it a, a, a challenge for myself to try to do a couple smaller ones because I know that the longer ones can be intimidating as well. So um, yeah, what is what is the channel name tomorrow? T M R O. Tomorrow, T M R O. Um, yeah, I'm gonna do a link here. YouTube.com slash tomorrow. Find it. Find it, love it, love it, find it. Yeah, I. Oh, uh, some other exciting things we need to look forward to. Uh, DM1, the, the demo, demo mission one for the Crew Dragon capsule, is coming up very soon. That's going to be a really exciting one. Um, Parker Solar Probe. Uh, sorry, the, the, the DM-1 will probably be, again, I, I think I mentioned a little bit ago, early early September-ish is my guess. 
Um, there's going to be a Boeing demonstration mission, so hopefully sometime soon as well. There's going to be the Parker Solar Probe flying on a Delta IV Heavy, which if you imagine three of these orange tanks stuck together with another thing on top and three awesome hydrogen-powered engines, you're looking at a Delta IV Heavy. Um, before Falcon Heavy, it's actually in some ways more capable, I think more capable to GTO than Falcon Heavy is um, because it has a really efficient upper stage engine. But um, it's only about half as powerful, actually, as, uh, as the Falcon Heavy. And Falcon Heavy... I don't think we'll ever see it flying expendable. So in its reusable form, it's similar to Delta IV. Delta IV Heavy is awesome. Made by ULA, United Launch Alliance. That's ha happening August 6th. Looks like we might be coming back here into the thing. I like this shot. That is awesome. Um, notice it is daylight now. The rocket's going, it'll be going through darkness from sunlight to sunset. Every 45 minutes, it's traveling at 17,500 miles an hour, 27,000 kilometers an hour. Um, so it now has already seen sunset. So good morning. Good morning. Uh, yeah, the other launch, so Parker Solar Probe, that is a NASA mission sending uh, a probe to the sun, which I'll do a video about because it's that's really cool. Uh, it'll be the closest any probe has ever gone to the sun to measure a lot of neat things. And the uh, I think in the, the corona or something crazy. Um, other than that, there's going to be another Falcon Heavy launch, hopefully this year. It will be made out of all Block 5 cores. So the Falcon Heavy we saw before was that pre-Block 5, that kind of Block 4-ish or whatever we're calling it these days. Uh, but yeah, the next one will be all Block 5. Here we Going go. Welcome back, everybody, as we near the end of our brief coast period, where Stage 2 is about to reignite to perform its second of the two planned burns. Now we're about 40 seconds away from SES-2 which is second engine start number two. Again, that's the second burn, and it will last for about 40 seconds, at which point you'll hear the terminating SECO2 callout, which stands for second engine cutoff number two. So stand by about 20 seconds until SES2. Hopefully they fire this up. Uh, Justin Martin, uh, thank you for switching over here. That's awesome. Uh, come to Vandenberg. You're launching Wednesday, I know. I wish. I just talked about that a second ago, actually. Uh, I live in Iowa, so Vandenberg's a ways away. But I will come to a Vandenberg launch very soon. That's on my immediate bucket list. Here we go. Listen, and you can see the orbit and changing. As you saw during that brief slice, we did see MVAC ignite. Again, 40-second burn here to perform final adjustments to get Telstar pointed into its desired final trajectory. Yep, so hopefully now it's in a good transfer orbit. We'll hear that call out here in a second. Confirmation. And then it coasts for a little bit, and then it'll deploy the satellite. Probably about a five-minute coast. Can you see the second stage at night? Yes, you would be able to at night when it's ignited, ignited, ignite. When it's, when it's firing, you should be able to see it... Uh, fairly well. It's not that bright though. We've not heard confirmation of a good second engine cutoff. Maybe they just forgot. Uh, I had two questions from Matt W. and Jason, the same question, uh, talking about Boeing with their Starliner, the CST-100 Starliner that will also be taking humans to space really soon. They're in a race with SpaceX to, to get the first astronauts up to the International Space Station. Hang on, I might want to make sure I'm not missing anything here. Um, so they're, they are working on certifying their, their vehicle for flight, obviously, to get humans on board as soon as possible. Uh, they did a pad abort test here recently, and it sounds like they may have had, the, it sounds like the engine firing went well, the engines went well, uh, it sounds like there may have been a small fuel leak afterwards. So that's all I'm hearing so far. 
Um, hopefully that's something they'll figure out right away and find the, the root cause and be able to fix it and stay on track with, with no further slip ups. I, it's getting aggressive. It's getting, we're getting down here. And if we don't get crew flying next year, uh, we're going to have cut off to the international space station because it looks like Russia is probably not going to be flying in 2020. So yeah, so we have got, (laughs) we absolutely have to get flying here ASAP, ASAP. Um, um, yeah, so, oh, Loopy in our Discord says um, they've already figured out the root cause of the issue on the Starliner for the abort motors. So it appears we've uh, got some light signal from our ground stations, so we're waiting until that communication channel stabilizes and we can get full confirmation that the second burn did shut down. So we'll let you know as soon as we have more data here in a moment. Whew. They scared me there for a second. They were a little too quiet on that. Um, uh, so, um, yeah, they're going to music, though. Guys, I hope this wasn't a failure. Uh, that was very unusual. And the fact that he was, like, typing. I don't want to get, like, conspiratorial here. Okay, we did have an update on the map there, so hopefully they just got their trajectory. I really hope. Because <laughs> this, guys, if if this is wrong, and they have an anomaly, there could be a stand down for a long time while they figure it out. So, yeah, um, fingers crossed here. Okay, we have an uplink. That's a good sign. Hopefully, they had a good injection burn like that. I'm sure it's fine. Okay, but it, so as you can see on your screen with the live video coverage, we did get feedback again. Signal for ground stations can go in and out sometimes, but we've got a strong, stable signal now. So we have video on board. Second stage uh, concluded its burn. Seco number two went well as MVACD shut down to conclude its second of the two God. planned burns. Now Telstar is in a good orbit after that final adjustment and the next milestone coming up about a minute or so from now is deployment of Telstar itself into geostationary transfer orbit. So we'll check in in about 60 seconds. And I wanted to point out, someone goes, the speed is falling down. That's normal because it's going uphill now. So the further away in an orbit of an object is, so if it's an elliptical orbit like this, like where it has a really high point and then gets really close, the further away it is, the slower it goes. So the, or the higher the orbit, the slower the object is traveling. And literally think of it as going up a hill, how you like go on a roller coaster, you get really slow at the top, and then when you go down and when you get to the bottom, you're, you're as fast as you're going. That's exactly the same. That's basically what an orbit is, really. Um, so um, that's normal. You'll see it slow down until it re- reaches apogee, its highest point, and then it'll speed right back up. And it just does that over and over. So there we go. Uh, and by the way, Loopy, again, uh, uh, Loopy in the in our Discord channel is reminding us though that that Boeing the reason they did find a root cause for that abort motor which is great and uh, and he reminds us this is why we test that's what tests are for is to find any issues like this oh good stage separation payload separation confirmed all right and as Telstar 19 Vantage fades into the distance after a gentle push from those deployment springs on second stage. That will bring an end to our webcast tonight. So wrapping up everything in quick summary, it was a great liftoff of both vehicles conjoined. We had the successful separation and landing of the first stage, and then second stage continued on with its two burns to deliver Telstar 19 Vantage to the geostationary transfer orbit. With that said, SpaceX would like to extend a sincere thank you to Telesat, our customer, as well as the payload manufacturer, SSL, and as always, the Air Force's 45th Space Wing for their range support, and the FAA. If you'd like to stay up to date with what we're doing here, please follow us on our social media channels via our Twitter feed, as well as Instagram or SpaceX.com. Again, thank you very much for joining us tonight. We'll see you in just a few days at the next launch. Yes, that is excellent. That is the best. I'm gonna see if SpaceX did anything on Instagram on this. I like to, I like to get in there right away and say hi because I love them. Um, all right, so that's oh, uh, obviously their webcast is concluded. Um, I'm just going to go ahead and get them turned away here.
So I'm going to go ahead and keep answering a few questions for a little bit. It's late here, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time here, because especially because we have another launch Wednesday morning, and I have to get a video out before then, so or get a video done by then. So, um, yeah, that was... <laughs> I got nervous there for a second, and I, that normally doesn't happen. So, Okay, so um, Justin Martin reminds us that you can see this second stage separation and burn clearly during the day. Good call, but it's, it's really, if you don't know where you're looking, at, it is hard to see during the day. Um, and, and you normally have to be downrange to be able to see the engine actually burning. Like, if it's coming at you, you probably wouldn't most likely see anything. Uh, Arvid Nilsson says, maybe not enough space-related, but you should do a video about the Norwegian... And Doya rocket that almost started a World War III. I've never heard of that. You have my interest. Uh, very interesting. I'll uh, remind me about Andoya. That's cool. Um, Saturn space shuttle plus five dollars. Uh, <laughs> all that Tony. Uh, I'll I'll look into the Saturn shuttle. I I this isn't ringing much of a bell for me. I'm sure it's some concept that I've seen or read about, but I'm completely blanking on right now. So. Uh, so I'll look into it, and if I really like what I see, which I probably will because it sounds awesome, I will definitely do a video on it. Uh, and Xorius, thanks for a great show as usual, and for all those who asked about Orbital Mechanics, play Kerbal Space Program. <laughs> I couldn't say it enough. I've learned so much about how orbits work, how orbital mechanics work, how rockets work by playing Kerbal Space Program. I, I used to do a lot of it on my channel. I've had a lot of people asking me to do it again. I'll probably get back to doing a few fun Kerbal live streams every now and then. Maybe maybe once a month. Maybe that can be a special treat once a month. I don't want to overload my channel, though, with Kerbal Space Program. That's something people criticized. Um, but I do want to do that for myself, and I think some people will enjoy that as well. So uh, we'll do that someday here. So, yes, watch and learn. It is so much fun. Chris Harris, is that a gigantic Telstar 19V in your pocket? Yes, that would be a very, very large... Uh, Satellite. Uh, will New Glenn be human rated? If so, will Blue Origin use their current capsule or will they have to develop a new capsule? Um, and congrats, SpaceX. Great question, Renau. Uh, new Glenn, the rocket that Blue Origin is, is developing, which is huge. This thing is as basically as, as capable as Falcon Heavy. The first stage is reusable. It's, it's massive. It's like almost the same diameter as the Saturn V. This thing is, I think it's seven, meter, seven meters wide, uh, I think. Don't quote me on that for sure. I think it's 7 meters wide. The, the Saturn V is 10 meters wide, so this thing is huge. Um, and they will have to develop a new capsule. That I, I don't think the the new Shepard capsule that we see them testing right now, I don't think there's any chance of it uh, being, able, like being deep space rated, you know, and having the life support and stuff or the heat shield or anything like that um, available for, uh, for any kind of long-term flight. So expect them to develop some kind of new spacecraft, or who knows, maybe... I mean, it'd be cool if they utilized an already built one. Why, you know, why go through all this work? Maybe they could launch a Starliner um, or some other, you know, an Orion capsule or something. Uh, who knows? It, it, the world's an oyster. Uh, Bruno, video about ESA and Italian companies. Yes, I have that on the list. Um, absolutely. Justin Martin, do I have an email I can shoot over some pics? Absolutely. Uh, you can find it at everydayastronaut.com. Uh, you can find my email there. Uh, send me some pics, yeah. Uh, make sure they're PG, please. <laughs> Larry Wu, thank you for the tip. Um, our, and Orland, Orland 612 in our Discord does uh, confirm it's 7 meters wide. Um, yeah. So I, I do need to see the uh, that that video about the Norwegian rocket incidents. That is so crazy. Um, oh, yeah. So that's a good, that's a good question. Um, I, I like this. The Scotland has been talking about. Uh, it sounds like uh, the UK is getting their first uh, orbital spaceport. I think operational spaceport here. It's basically going to be using some kind of like Electron partnered with Lockheed Martin, maybe rocket to launch small sats. Sounds awesome. Uh, Twenty twenty one sounds like the launch date. I think that's great. I don't think you need any more of an opinion from me than the more the merrier absolutely i can't wait i would love for uk to to be launching regularly as well sounds awesome so uh yeah that i don't know why that one felt so sorry in discord people are, are mentioning that it it felt a little more nail biting this time this launch did that was weird like we're so used to having constant call outs and for them to have radio silence followed by a uh we have to check and wait for a downlink just sounded 
funny at first, so I'm really glad that the mission went off uh, smoothly. Yeah, my heart stopped there for a minute. So um, we will absolutely do that, Raj. Uh, a Starliner versus Dragon Two. I have a lot of cool content coming up. I have a really in-depth and exciting video I think that I'll be doing uh, about Starliner here soon. Um, something kind of special that I hope you guys are super super into. Um, yeah, uh, why does the camera shot look so different between the two upper stage cameras? That's a really good question. Uh, Inridus618 in Discord. I don't actually know why the two cameras look so different on the upper stage. Maybe they're testing out which ones they like better or something. Really a great question. Um, oh man, the needle and disaster puppeteer. I don't even know if I want to go there. That is insane. 150 people lost their lives on that launch pad. Uh, when a when a when a rocket X wall is fueled up, they had people working on it. That would be a really sad video. I don't know how I'd be able to. Um, yeah, I don't know how I'd really be able to deal with that. So um, yeah, um, will I cover the e the ESAS launch in a few days? Maybe. Uh, how complete is SLS? Uh, pretty far along, they they have the oxygen tank done, and I think it's getting its foam coating right now. Uh, they've certified the uh, RS-25 or the space shuttle main engines that will be there'll be four of them on the core stage of the SLS rocket. Um, they have that done. They have the interim cryogenic upper stage that'll be used in the Block One version of SLS done. They've been testing the solid rocket boosters. Basically, they have like. It's like 95% done, which, sunk cost fallacy aside, it would be such a shame if it didn't fly at this point, because it's so far along. It will be the most powerful rocket to fly. Um, that is, unless by some... I don't want to say miracle, because it wouldn't be that big of a miracle, but uh, at this point, 2020, 2021, there's a ch tiny chance BFR might be flying by then. Uh, but I, I would actually, at this point, bet money on SLS flying... If SLS flies, I'll say this, if SLS flies, it'll fly before then. Otherwise, it'll just kind of get get pushed too far and it'll get canned, um, unfortunately. So, um, yeah, we will we will see. Um, oh, wait. The, oh, yeah, the Intel sat launch was crazy. That one may have, unfortunately, killed even more people. I don't like talking about launches that had loss of life. That is really bad. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, oh yeah, someone asks, who makes these spinning globes behind me? Mova Globes, M-O-V-A, movainternational.com. Uh, yes, or, or check out my website, everydayastronaut.com. Uh, check on partners, and I have a, a link in there for Mova Globes. They are awesome. I'm a huge fan of these things. They spin by solar panels inside them, which is very confusing, yet absolutely incredible. Um, yeah. Um, Let's see. Am I going to do this? Uh, yes, I'm going to live stream the ULA Parker Solar Probe. I, I mentioned that a little earlier in the show that I will be for sure live streaming it. Maybe. Tiny chance I'll actually be there live streaming. Uh, I'll be down in Florida the couple days before that, so there's a tiny chance. I don't know. I might be zipping back and forth between Florida and Houston during those days. I don't know. Everything's up in the air right now, but plan on me live streaming it, whether it's in person there or right here. I almost, I love seeing a launch in person, but just as far as like ease of doing live streams, I really prefer this. So uh, I wouldn't be, I, I don't like missing launches. I love seeing them in person, especially if I'm there a day or two, but I want to wait until I have a better live streaming capability. Um, like Das Valdez on Twitch has this awesome thing called Live View where he takes four aggregate sim services and they aggregate into one solid, clean live stream. I'm going to wait until I have a good solution, which I'm getting figured out actually this week, um, so that hopefully when I do live stream launches out of the Cape, I have something similar. But the only thing is I like having a downlink as well, so you can I can pull up other feeds and, and include that in my launch, so, um, or into my broadcast. Um, anyway, yeah, that was a long rant about that. So hopefully I can do that someday. Um, yeah. <laughs> um... Let's see. Yeah, Loopy. Yeah, he's. I've been talking to Doss about the backpack. It is pretty, pretty sweet. Um, the gun run backpack. Yeah, that's exactly what it is. It's pretty. It's a pretty slick system. Um, uh, Manalope uh, Discord. We'll talk about this here 
uh, we'll take this this conversation here someday into uh, like general or something. Uh, so stay tuned. I'll tell you guys all about that. Um, it's a pretty slick system, but we're also working on another idea. DOS's system is amazing, but it might just be like too much for what I need. I kind of have kind of yeah. I'll explain it. Um, so anyway, how would I rate the Block Five cameras? Um, I don't know. Uh, they uh, someone also asked the SpaceX a GoPro user. No, they they do not use GoPros. They have their own kind of in-house system that they are working on, and it's awesome. But so far, I, I'd like to see it get tweaked a little bit further. We'll see if they can really dial those babies in. So, um, one of the first Enterprise launch. Well. And the Enterprise did fly once, but not launch. Of course, I'm talking about Space Shuttle Enterprise, which did some drop tests, some gliding tests, uh, but never launched. Um, yeah. So, let's see here. That's awesome. All right, so I, I think, guys, I'm going to tune out here. It's Again, it's 1.35 a.m. for me. Uh, I have a lot of work to do here before Wednesday morning when there's a the next launch. So stay tuned. Uh, thank you so much for tuning in. Again, last reminder that if you want, or not last reminder, last reminder for today, because these are, I think this stuff's super exciting. I love flown material. I have a lot of flown material on my walls. Uh, if you want a chance to win some flown hardware that was flown on space shuttles, uh, please consider supporting via Patreon, patreon.com slash everydayastronaut. Um, and so again, every dollar you contribute per month puts your name in a hat, and then we do a spreadsheet thing and, and boop, randomizer. Ta-da, and then I'll ship it to you. Uh, so that'll be at the 800 and 900 thing. Uh, the, the Marks, it's getting late. I'm getting tired. I can't even think. Uh, make sure you're following me on Instagram and Twitter uh, and Facebook or wherever. I post everywhere. I post the same thing everywhere, basically. So wherever you're at, come find me. Uh, make sure That way you can stay up to date with everything. I'm actually really active, more active on Twitter these days than I really am almost anywhere else besides YouTube. So... Um, so, and thank you, and Justin Martin, uh, check your email, cool stuff, also SpaceX did still use GoPros, that's how we got fairing recovery footage. I don't know if they're GoPros, man, I, I, I actually am positive they are not GoPros, but I will, I will check my email, thank you, um, and thank you for the, the generous tip, uh, and thank you to all those who tipped as well and, and helped support, so... Oh, they apparently did literally use uh, Orlando um, falling back to Earth HD footage from space. Was it actually a GoPro? We'll see. I don't know if it was actually a GoPro, but I'll find out. I'll do some research. All right. They are not GoPros. Yeah. There we go. Uh, yeah. I'm 99999% sure they are not GoPros. But GoPro used that in their ad. So maybe they threw one in there for the fairing just to use it for GoPro for them to have fun with. Um, yeah. So, okay, that's going to do it for me, guys. Um, thank you again for tuning in. Join me Wednesday morning. There's going to be uh, Iridium 7 launch, and hopefully we'll see a fairing recover and uh, the first Block 5 on the West Coast. going to be very exciting. Thank you, Schizo Jedi, for the tip. Um, yeah, and guys, check out my website as well, uh, everydayastronaut.com. I'm keeping news going now, too, as well, so launch coverage. Uh, stop in there. Come say hi. Share it with a friend. So, yeah, baby. All right. Thank you, everybody. I, I hope you guys have a great rest of your weekend. That's going to do it for me. I'm Tim Dodd, the everyday astronaut bringing space down to Earth for everyday people. Bye, everybody.